My daughter and I text back and forth a lot. Here's one from her. I pray that there's someone, if there's anyone bigger than all of us, to get me through this. Because some days, I feel like I'm at a breaking point. But then I think, or pray, or whatever you want to call it, about finishing school, working hard, and speaking up for those who aren't ready to speak up for themselves about addiction. And I know I have to keep going. I just have to hope that one day I'll look back on all this and somehow be thankful that I went through it, that it made me, well, me. I'm a father, not an expert on addiction. I'm not an expert on fatherhood either, for that matter. When my daughter fell into the trap of addiction, and it is a trap, it felt like it somehow failed in my responsibility as a father to protect her. Addiction is eerily similar to a kidnapping, like those chilling surveillance camera images where a child takes the hand of some stranger and walks off with them. By the time you've seen what happened, they're already gone. After that, you spend every day hoping your kid will find their way home again. You'll have to excuse me for one moment. I'm pulling a blank. The narcotic oxycodone grabbed our daughter during the summer of her college sophomore year, working nights on the Point Pleasant boardwalk. By the following spring semester, her academic performance at Rutgers was in a steep decline, and she was clearly depressed. We tried talking to her many times, but addicts will lie. They lie because they're ashamed of being kidnapped by addiction. They lie because they're afraid, physically sick, and confused, all of which leads them back to their addiction. The drug is the cause of and solution to their suffering. What could be more diabolical? And I mean that in the most literal sense. The lies and excuses went on for over a year. After one awful confrontation with her mother and me, I followed her into her room and sat silently on her bed while she went through her clothes. I didn't know what more I could say to her. Finally, I simply said, I don't want you to leave without hope. She continued going through her clothes, not looking at me, and said, there's hope. I didn't know what she meant. I thought it was just more deflection, and I got up and left without another word. Her mother, Susan, bless her, had enough. She was determined to get at the truth, and the next day drove to the house where our daughter was living with her boyfriend. But her daughter wasn't there. Instead, the boyfriend's mother came to the door, invited Susan in, and explained. Our daughter and her son had entered a methadone program together. The first thing Susan did when she left that house was call our daughter and say, we know. It's going to be all right. You can talk to us now. Our girl took that first brave step to escape addiction on her own, hoping we'd never discover the truth. She didn't want to fail us or herself, so she hid the problem for a long time. That's part of the harm the social stigma of addiction does. It shames you when you need to believe in yourself. It isolates you at the worst possible time. It keeps you down. I deeply regret it took as long as it did to recognize what was happening, but we didn't understand how pervasive the problem was. And addiction seemed so unlikely for this very bright, likable, sensitive young woman. After we found out, I felt so naive, so clueless. I started researching it, talking to people, and discovered the problem was way bigger than I imagined. Right here in our local two-county area, we are inundated with prescription narcotics, and it's a direct outgrowth of that heroin. I know you're a thoughtful audience because you're here, but are you a brave audience? What I'd like to see is a show of hands from you brave ones out there if you have a loved one or an acquaintance who struggles with narcotic addiction. We need to confront the true extent of the problem.
Okay, for those of you who didn't raise your hands, you now know me, so welcome to the family. <laughs> Addicts and the people who suffer alongside them are all around you. Throw out any preconceptions of what or who you think an addict is. They could be anyone. According to the CDC, the group with the highest risk of mortality from prescription narcotics is white middle-aged males. Last year, over 16,000 people in the US died from prescription narcotics, a fourfold increase in 15 years. Bookmark that 15-year period. We're going to come back to it in a moment. This is an epidemic with deeply troubling origins. Aside from recognizing the extent of addiction in this country, we need to ask, how did this happen? We need to know how the wildfire started and who's responsible for setting it. Let's talk a little business. OxyContin, for those who don't know, is the extended release form of the powerful narcotic oxycodone and the most abused pill on the market for over a decade. Production of OxyContin grew 1,200% from 8 tons to 105 tons since its introduction in 96. The manufacturer, Purdue Pharma, made $2.8 billion in the first six years of production by marketing OxyContin to physicians as a low-risk, rarely addictive form. It turned out to be hugely addictive. And in 2007, Purdue Pharma pleaded guilty in a federal court to the charge of intent to defraud and mislead the public. They were ordered to pay $600 million in fines as a company, plus an additional $34 million from their president, top attorney, and medical director in lieu of jail time. Fast forward to the present. Many areas of the country are experiencing disproportionately high rates of addiction associated with the black market availability of oxycodone. Why is there such a huge black market? I'll give you the simple answer. Supply exceeds legitimate medical need, which begs the question, what is legitimate medical need? During that 15-year period where we saw the four-fold jump in mortality, pharmaceutical marketing repositioned narcotics essentially creating broader indications for use, including arthritis, chronic back pain, fibromyalgia, migraines, dentistry. In 2012, 259 million prescriptions were written for narcotics, enough for every adult in the country to take round the clock for a month. Why? Ask yourself why. Why? <laughs> of course, narcotics can be beneficial. They're currently the only class of drug that offers relief to those suffering with cancer, and they're appropriate for the short-term pain management of trauma and post-surgical situations. Opiates have a place in our care, but there's very little evidence to support long-term effectiveness in non-cancer cases. There are three main links in the chain of legal distribution. Manufacturers, doctors, and the government, specifically the FDA and the DEA. The manufacturer's goal is to make money by producing as much of the drug as they are legally allowed to under guidelines set by the government. The physician's role is to offer palliative care, ease pain, while doing no harm in the process. The FDA is responsible for green lighting the manufacture and sale of all drugs. And in the case of narcotics, works directly with the DEA, who says how much can get made in a given year, based on nationwide need. That chain of distribution raises some big questions regarding culpability. Leaving aside the very small minority of doctors who write prescriptions solely for profit, how much blame does the medical community bear for prescribing a high-risk drug? Why didn't the FDA respond more effectively to the commercial flood of narcotics onto the marketplace? And why did the DEA sanction massive production increases for over a decade? 
One of my sisters was out in Southern California where wildfires can sometimes burn uncontrollably. She pointed out an interesting fact when I used fire as a metaphor to describe the spread of addiction. She said, did you know that wildfires create their own wind? That's where we're at, in the middle of a wildfire that has progressed to the point of fanning its own flame. It's out of control. How do we move forward? There's no single answer, but I'll offer three basic strategies I believe are starting points. The first is to limit supply by halting overproduction and tightening guidelines for use. Many will fight that approach. I understand many people live with pain, but it's a necessary action and one of the few tangible measures we can take. Secondly, we need to attack demand. At the very least, that means frank, ongoing discussions in our schools, places of worship, our families. Plus, we need a stepped-up national media campaign exposing the trap of addiction and the carnage it creates. And thirdly, we have to do a better job of helping the addicted. That's a subject that deserves a talk all its own. Yes, bad decisions and personal responsibility and accountability, they play a critical role in addiction. But no one chooses to be an addict. A lot of people don't get that. Nobody takes the stranger's hand thinking they won't see home again. Many addicts are turning to heroin. It's cheap and easy to come by. The CDC reports that heroin deaths have doubled in the past two years. But consider, 75% of heroin users start with pills. So in time, if we halt the overproduction, educate the public, provide a way forward for the addicted, we will see the fire die down. We won't put it out entirely, but we can get to a much better place. For those of you who feel that none of this is really your concern, it's vitally important you understand that this is happening in your town, on your street. It could be in your home and you don't realize it yet. Addiction is an evil that doesn't make distinctions. And we all pay the price as a society. As for our daughter, she struggles with regret, but she's a fighter. She's back in school, working full time, and at the tail end of a long taper off methadone. She's come a long way. We're happy for her, proud of her, but we know the fight's not over yet. She's adamant she'll never return to that desperate, hopeless place we call addiction. She's committed to her recovery. But I'll leave you with the same piece of advice I share with her. Don't turn your back on the devil. Stay well, and thank you for listening. <laughs>